Hey there! Let's continue our series on Stoicism while we go through the Enchiridion by Epictetus in the translation How to Be Free by Professor A. A. Long. And today we have a difficult chapter ahead of us because now we stray into the realm of formal logic and I will explain more about that. So, chapter 36. You can form a valid disjunctive statement from the propositions it is day and it is night taken separately, either it is day or it is night, but the conjunctive statement, both it is day and it is night, is completely invalid. In other words, logically, formally speaking, or formally logically speaking, it cannot be day and night at the same time. I'll come back to this. Similarly, at a dinner party, choosing the larger share could have positive value for the body, but it has negative value for maintaining the sociability the occasion requires. So when you are dining with someone, be mindful not only to note the value of the dishes for your body, but also to show respect for your host. Now, this latter argument, this, this ties into things we have discussed many times before now, right? You, you, like you, you, uh, for example, I think two videos ago we talked about how you can, you may want something, but you know it's not really good for you, it's not really the right thing to do, and then if you take a minute, you can picture, picture this sort of the aftermath of that, where you think, oh, actually, if I would do it, then later I'll feel bad about myself, etc., so I probably should not do it, right? Again, that is one of those cardinal virtues of moderation or temperance. Now, what I would really like to talk about today, because we've already talked about these types of arguments a lot, what I want to talk about today is this, is this formal logic, without going into too much detail. So, let's, let's put this in a historical context, okay? The, the school of the Stoa, Stoicism, was founded by Zeno of Citium, which is, which is in Cyprus, and... At some point, he has he has gone through his training with other philosophers, a cynic, and I think he even went to the Magellanarians at some point. In any case, he, he goes to a couple of different so, uh, philosophical schools, and then he establishes his own school. Now, that day and age, this is Athens about, give or take, to, uh, a few years, 2300 years ago, and he, he starts to teach philosophy himself. Now, in that day and age, philosophy was a little different from what it is now. Philosophy was a philosophy of life, which means that there were no psychologists, there were no psychiatrists, so if you had any issues in life, you would go to a philosopher. And a philosopher would tell you, oh, well, according to the principles of my school, you could tackle this problem by doing this and this and that. Or, well, maybe, in the case of a Stoic, maybe uh, the fact that your uh, brother died is really not that terrible. You're only making it terrible because of the way you think about it. I'm, I'm, make, I'm simplifying this a little bit, right? But that's what a Stoic could tell you. So the Stoics, or any philosopher there, could, could help you out with life's problems. But you could also go to a Stoic school, or uh, an Epicurean school, Plato's Academy, uh, and Aristotle's Lyceum, the, the Garden of Epicurus, the, the Stoa for the Stoics, and you could start to train in that school of philosophy if you really liked it. Now in the case of the Stoics, there were three branches, three things, or for my European friends, three things, I'm thinking of you then, uh, three things that you could study there, and that you had to study. It was a curriculum you had to, you had to go through. And in, for me, no particular order, there was, for the Stoics, logic, physics, and ethics. Now, what we've been talking about up to this point is Stoic ethics, okay? Ethics <clears throat> in ancient philosophy are not what ethics are today. Today, ethics are difficult moral issues like should abortion be legal, should it not be legal, should, and this is not a discussion we're going to have now. But that's kind of it. Back in the day, the, time, the Stoics, for example, ethics dealt with how, should, how could you lead a good life? How can you lead that rich and fulfilling life of evdemonia that we talked about many times before? How do you do that? And the Stoics had a certain answer to that question. The Cynics had a slightly different answer. The Epicureans had a very different answer. So all the different schools had different answers. And the Stoics said, well, to fully lead a good life, you not only, you not only need to understand ethics, like uh, it's not the thing that bothers you, but how you think about it, some things are within your control, some things are outside of your control, there are dispreferred and preferred indifference, all of that is Stoic ethics. But the Stoics also said, there was two more things you need. You need physics and logic. Now, we can talk for hours on both of those things, but I want to try and keep this within 15 minutes. 
What the heck is stoic ethics? What the heck is stoic logic? What the heck is stoic physics? Well, ethics I just discussed. Stoic physics. Why are they important? That's the only thing you really need to take away from this. Why, why, why are physics important? Well, the Stoics, say, Stoics would say, well, obviously physics are important because if you need to lead a good life, you need to become a sage, and none of us will, but that's okay. You make progress towards becoming a sage, and that's good enough. But being a sage means being wise, and being wise means making the right decisions. All else being the same, you have to make the right decision every time. And the only way you can make the right decision is if you understand the laws of the universe. How could you make the right decision if you don't know how the world works? And that is Stoic Physics. Now, my favorite part of Stoic Physics, because Stoic Physics is very difficult, okay? There's, there's like the separate textbooks on Stoic Physics. So it's very difficult. Here's a couple of highlights. The Stoics were materialists. They believe that everything, they believe in materialism. Everything is materialistic. You, you, you can sort of touch it, right? which is why they also didn't really believe in an afterlife. They said, soul, what soul? It has to be materialistic, right? So they, they believed in a soul, but it, it's, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm making this a little simpler than it was because just the argument on stoic soul would take up a few hours. So everything is materialistic. Uh, they were sort of determinists. They said everything has a cause, and you have causal change, chains, and those causal change make things happen. But they also said, however, you're still responsible for your choices. So that's more compatibilism, we would say now. My favorite thing of Stoic Physics, though, is the Great Conflagration. They said, okay, the universe is a big, rational, living being. And, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> and it was created by Zeus, the highest of the gods. And Zeus is a completely perfect and rational being. Now, every... They're not very clear about this, but they, they kind of took this from an older philosopher who predates them. Um, every great year, for example, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is a, is a platonic concept, I, and I, I always understood it as when all the celestial bodies are in exactly the same place again, where they were when they were created, that's the end of a great year. And when that happens, the Stoics say, then there will be a great conflagration. And that means that the entire universe will go back to one to the divine element. They believed in different elements. One was the divine element, fire. The whole universe will go up in flames. And that's called a conflagration. Cleanthes, the, the second head of the, of the Stoa, uh, describes that beautifully. How all the planets willingly throw them, or actually all the celestial bodies, throw themselves into the sun willingly. Because again, if the whole universe is a rational being, then the planets have a will of their own too, right? So they throw themselves into the sun and everything burns up. And the only thing that then remains is Zeus as the highest of the gods. And Zeus is perfect, so what will Zeus do? Zeus will recreate the universe, but he is perfect. So he has to recreate it the exact same way he created it the first time. Because if you're a perfect being, there's only one way to do something. The perfect way. So Zeus recreates the universe after a conflagration. The great rebirth. Right? And the whole universe is remade exactly how it was before. And that means that you will be born again. And you will lead out the exact same life you led out the first ten million times exact same thing. You'll meet exactly the same people at the same time in your life. You will say the exact same things at the exact same times, every time, every cycle of conflagration and rebirth. And that means in reality you are immortal. Because even though at some point you die, after the next conflagration, you will be reborn and you get to lead out your entire life again and again and again. And even if you don't believe in this, and I'm not saying that I do, I think it's a fantastic thought. Isn't it interesting? That because that means, if that's true, that you've watched this video many, many, many times before, and you were doing the exact same thing, drinking the exact same thing, sitting in the exact same place, being the exact same person. I find that absolutely fascinating and mind-boggling, even if it's not true, although there is sort of a modern cosmological theory, which, which is a little bit like conflagration, but that's just a coincidence. That's Stoic Physics. The rules of the universe. What's Stoic Logic? Interesting, too. 
Stoic logic, formal logic. Formal logic uh, is a matter of reasoning, proper reasoning. And if you've ever taken a course in introductory psychology, you may have been exposed to a bit of formal reasoning, let alone a course on actual formal logic in philosophy, of course. And the Stoics contributed a lot to logic, especially Chrysippus, the third head of the Stoa, the school. Uh, he, he wrote a lot about logic, probably to sort of fend off their, their, the, the people against Stoicism. What is formal logic? You basically reason to a conclusion that is logically valid on the basis of the information that you have. Now, at that time, logic was dominated by Aristotelian logic, the logic from Aristotle, which, let's look at a very simple example, okay? We typically explain logic in terms of syllogisms, the type of reasoning where you have a, a couple of premises and then you have a conclusion. You have to figure out if the conclusion is logically valid, if it follows logically from those premises. And Aristotelian logic is basically categorical syllogisms. You recognize those by premises starting with something like all or some or none. So here's a, a famous one. All men are mortal. Premise one. Premise two. Socrates is a man. Conclusion. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. True. Completely logically valid. You can't argue with that. Okay, that's a categorical syllogism. Now what the Stoics added to that, and that is still being used and studied today, is the conditional syllogism. You may have heard of those terms, modus ponens, modus tollens, etc. Different forms of reasoning. These you recognize because they typically start with the word if. Okay, here's a, a good example of a syllogism, a conditional syllogism that the Stoics could propose. If it rains, then I get wet. It rains, therefore, I get wet. This is logically valid. A logically valid syllogism. Inescapable conclusion. If it rains and I get wet, it rains, well, then I, then I must get wet. But now you can play with this and turn this into a, um, um, a fallacy. If it rains, then I get wet. I get wet. Therefore, it rains. Ah, but that is not logically valid. It, it, it could be true. But there are all kinds of other things now that, have could have, that could have made you wet. You could have fallen into a ditch, someone could have thrown a cup of water in your face, all kinds of things could have happened. And then, when there are multiple explanations like that, then it's not logically valid. It must be an inescapable conclusion. And the Stoics said, well, obviously physics is important. If you want to become an enlightened wise man, a wise person, a sage, you need to understand the laws of the universe. And logic is very important because if you cannot reason properly, how on earth could you ever make the right conclusion. Now a lot of Stoic physics I think has been disproven by modern science. I don't think there would be a lot of people who would say the entire universe is a giant rational living creature. But when it comes to logic that's a different story. I think it is very good to understand the basics of logic so you can understand and sort of dissect people's arguments. So this was more of a theoretical background on Stoicism. And if you would be a student at the Stoa, you would get physics, you would get logic, and then you would get ethics. Right? So those three components of Stoicism are always interwoven. But typically, uh, these, these sort of, let's say, the self-help side of, of, of Stoicism focuses way, way, way more on ethics than on logic and physics. But I have now done my duty by explaining a little bit of both to you in hopes that that will be interesting. For sure, look up logic. I think that, that is, it, it's kind of fun and it can really help you reason, which I think is a very, very good thing. And that's all there's to it. So, I hope this was helpful and um, I'm glad to see you later. Bye-bye.